The meeting of the Board of Elders County Commissioners will now come to order. Let's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hey, Bobby, if you want to call the roll. Commissioner Dean Hazelhorst? Present. Commissioner Chair Butch Schleyer? Present. Commissioner Neil Younger? Present. Have a quorum. Okay, thank you. Uh, order of business. I don't think there's any changes or any additions. We will have two executive sessions this evening. Uh, prior minutes. Commissioners, did you review the prior minutes? Everything looked good. Oh, good. Did a good okay. job. Then the minutes will stand as submitted. Do I hear a motion for the consent agenda? <laughs> Let me make a motion to for the kids end agenda items A through G. Second that. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes 3 0. Any issues from persons not on the order of business? <coughs> See any hands going up? So, okay, then the next agenda item is a High Plains Mental Health Annual Report. Walt. Seems like it's been forever since we've seen Walt here. I just come sometimes for entertainment value. <laughs> entertainment is good. <laughs> <coughs> and I'll be back next week. Hat in hand. <laughs> so <laughs> this is, uh, I'm Walt Hill. I'm the executive director at High Plains Mental Health Center. Appreciate the time this evening. This is the first of two meetings we have with you. This is a, an annual report on behalf of High Plains to you as one of the 20 <coughs> counties that comprise 
the interlocal agreement that sets up high planes. Some agencies that you fund, uh, you fund through contractual arrangements, high planes, you have established us through that interlocal agreement and we're technically what's called a quasi-municipality uh, because we're an arm of county government. It's a bit of an unusual uh, designation. We're, for example, audited as a count under county audit principles. Uh, and um, uh, there are three ways in Kansas. Mental health centers are set up. Independent nonprofit corporations uh, like we are county departments. So that interlocal agreement calls for us to meet uh, annually, provide a report. Of course, I will be here anytime you want me to, to give you any updates on any issues. But this is a formal report uh, based on that uh, uh, our agreement uh, with the counties. This is the last of the 20 county meetings we've had. All of them have been very positive. Um, talked a lot about the impact of COVID uh, on us and our communities. Um, it has been a bit of a uh, challenge. There were some months where we were a little concerned, like last July, where you know our finances were, you know, we were nearly uh, half a million dollars in the red. Um, things were very slow. What was most important to us was continuing to get people the services that they needed. That was a challenge because we'd sent staff home. They were working from their homes. We had very few staff in the office, but all of our counselors, uh, therapists, uh, case managers worked from home. We had uh, just begun to uh, bring on board a number of iPads and we quickly uh, increased those just before the, the big hit from COVID. So people worked from home, they had computers that could access the electronic records of patients. And uh, I, show, I handed out a chart that we just finished that showed the number of uh, patients we saw each month during COVID, um, which showed it, we, uh, that was my big concern, that we have a drop off, people didn't get services when they needed it. And the data suggested people still got the services. Uh, we went from like 15% of services prior to COVID being uh, by virtual uh, telemedicine up to at several points, 95, 96% of patients were served through telemedicine. And um, that was pretty effective. We even uh, were concerned that it met people's needs. So we contacted 800 of our patients that we delivered telemedicine service to and asked them a survey, a sample. Did this work for you? Did you get what you needed? Would you want to continue doing this? A third of people said, oh, I'd rather just keep being seen this way forever, not have to come into the office. A third said, either way is fine. I get what I need. And a third said, I want to come back to the office as soon as I can. So um, it's really becoming a, an accepted model across the country to do a hybrid service to deliver services. Um, whether the payers will go along with that, uh, we will see. But it works in terms of patient satisfaction and getting services out the door. We have all of our staff back in the office now, uh, effective the 1st of April. Um, and services continue to be, um, you know, solid. We see, we saw some increase in crisis services during COVID. Um, I think most people did uh, across the mental health system. In your packet is a uh, report specifically for Ellis County that has the red graph at the top. This shows um, in 2020, um, we saw approximately another uh, 92 Ellis County citizens prior to what we saw in 2019. Um, the, um, you know, we have a couple of offices uh, in unique situations here in Ellis County. We go into the Ellis County Health Department and see patients there. We rent space there to see 
patients who come in there and uh, we saw 35 patients there. 14 of those were new to us, so they are able to get in, not have to come into our office. They're already in the health department office and come in there to get started and get their services. And then we have um, office that we rent at uh, Hayes Family Medicine. Um, and we saw 95 patients there last year. 79 of those were new patients to us. So we were able to offer pretty easy access if a patient went in to, at that time, see, say, Dr. Rajeski, and he thought they needed to come in and see us, uh, they could send them just down the hall and we would get them uh, opened. And uh, it's a really popular model. I think we'll continue to expand that. So in 2020, we delivered uh, $4.6 million in patient services to Ellis County citizens. Um, that uh, is uh, to about a third of our, third of the total patients we see are from Ellis County. Um, about two thirds of our payroll uh, is to Ellis County residents and that payroll is uh, $4.1 million or about 70% of our payroll goes to residents of Ellis County because we have the centralized services here and major, uh, though we have branch offices, Goodland, Colby, Norton, Phillipsburg, and Osborne, and uh, each county we have an outreach office one day a week at least, usually in a doctor's office. So you're, um, say, $275,000, $280,000 county funding support allowed us to deliver um, over four and a half million dollars in services to Ellis County citizens. Many of those have lower incomes. 52% um, of the patients from Ellis County that we saw that year had in family incomes under $25,000. So we use county funds to help provide a subsidy so that patients don't have to pay the full cost of services. We have services based on a sliding fee uh, contingent upon their income level. Um, we make up the rest with insurance payments, uh, state grants, um, and uh, uh, some state funding. Um, there is a center-wide report that shows overall we can have seen more patients um, again across the, the entire 20 counties. Um, you know, in addition to the patients that we see here in Ellis County, uh, be that by our psychiatrists, our nurse practitioners, our therapists, we also provide services um, that aren't patients necessarily. Crisis services when law enforcement or emergency workers deal with a crisis situation. Uh, we do that across the 20 counties. If there's a, a, a difficult situation that EMS or law enforcement runs into with a bad accident, a suicide, we have teams of people that will go out and help debrief those emergency responders uh, if we're requested. Uh, we also provide a significant amount of what's called mental health first aid, which is a, about a one-day one day training? One-day training for anyone, EMS, teachers, anyone in the community, of how to deal with someone who's having a mental health crisis. What this does is may, helps people feel more comfortable if someone they know says something, which often we're uncomfortable, I am still. Someone says X, Y, or Z, I feel like hurting myself. I feel so depressed. A lot of times we don't know what to say. This training basically helps people learn how to deal with that and how to get the person to help, just like with regular first aid or CPR. And uh, over 90% of people who take that class, which has been over uh, 1,300, 3,000, she's 3,000 people across the 20 counties. 90% or more say after the class they feel more comfortable in helping someone get to services, or in fact, they helped someone 
get to services. So that's a service we provide basically uh, free of charge uh, at, at the request of um, whoever in the area wants. We, um, the, one of the challenges that I do want to mention, and uh, I think I've re related this last year, is the challenges with inpatient psychiatric care availability. Larnes State Hospital has reduced the number of beds available, so we have situations where they are not taking admissions and patients who law enforcement bring into the emergency department or deal with in their jails throughout our area, including here, are holding these patients in, they're basically being boarded in emergency rooms pending admission to Larnes State Hospital for sometimes two, three days. We are, um, it's a major issue for law enforcement. It's a major issue for Hayes Med. We're um, several, uh, we've been in communication with state legislators about this issue. We're setting up a meeting before the end of the month to bring them out. People from KDADS who have responsibility for, um, for the state hospitals and to ask questions. When are those beds going to return? The same for the kids psychiatric inpatient beds that were here in Hayes that were closed last year. Last legislative session, Representative Billinger, our Senator Billinger, um, forwarded a bill to put a million dollars in to reopen that kid's psychiatric unit here in Hayes. That was last session, not the most immediate session a year ago. It's not happened yet. So we will be bringing people together to ask the state what's the holdup because it creates we have parents who have kids who need to go to the hospital for psychiatric reason who say, I just can't take my kid down to Wichita and spend a week or more with them while they're there. And they don't uh, admit kids. We have that pretty frequently at Westside School. Kids get really out of hand, really depressed. Uh, they, prob they do need to go to the hospital, but that's just a long haul to take a kid to Kansas City or Wichita for hospitalization. So we've pushed that hard, worked with Senator Billinger to get that restored. Now they just need to open those beds. So I know it's an issue for uh, the sheriff here in town. It's for the police chief here in town in all 20 counties. Um, I just want to make you aware of that, that it's, it's a real drain on resources, that it's not a drain. <laughs> It needs to happen. You got to keep people safe, but they really need to be in a better setting, a more appropriate setting for treatment, not waiting in a jail or an emergency room for two or three days. The good news potentially is some uh, major increase in funding from the federal government for something called Certified Community Behavioral Health Centers. This is a new designation for mental health centers that sets a higher bar for services, more services out to people in emergencies in the community, services to veterans, uh, services to schools, faster access. Um, this is moving across the country with developing these, with the funding to do that. We just, uh, in March, uh, first of March, finished a one, uh, $2 million two-year grant to establish those services with federal funding. So $4 million coming here. And then um, we haven't heard yet about that. The good news is we're working to with the state very positively to establish a way that Medicaid will sustain those services with cost-based reimbursement, similar to what they do with rural hospitals and the FQHC, to reimburse us for the cost of service, not just fee for service. And then we uh, just applied for a, um, another federal grant for one and a half million dollars twice for over two years to even add on to that. So we potentially have seven million dollars coming into the community over the next two and a half years to increase service level, increase number of staff by 20 and have the funding to support that without drawing on federal or on local resources um, using federal funds and then um, 
uh, sustaining that over time with Medicaid. It's a pretty big deal, uh, and um, it's, I told uh, one of our the heads of our National Association of Mental Health Centers, I'm kind of an old curmudgeon. I've been around about 40 years. I don't get excited about much, uh, except this is one of the most exciting things I've ever seen in my career in mental health. To finally see mental health being recognized and by the federal government, and uh, finally, since you know, the middle 1950s, putting dollars in, federal dollars into community mental health centers to deliver services. So it is an exciting time. So I'll stop there. Uh, be glad to answer any questions. Uh, again, appreciate it. Bill uh, is. Uh, Always been interested in mental health. We've had a really good relationship. Looking forward to his experience and uh, beyond roads and bridges and helping us. So, and we'll be back next week. Looking since, forward to that. Since so. I'm new, how many are staffed? I know two of them. How many? How many are here? Mm -hmm. Kaylee uh, yes. Connor yes. is our public uh, relations uh, marketing okay. person. That's the only other staff member with me tonight. Okay. But here in Hayes, we have over 100 staff that are based in Hayes. Um, total of about 150 staff throughout the whole uh, 20 county area. Okay. Thank you. Walt. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Walt. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the fleet management program. This Brandon gets set up here. I just wanted to take a couple minutes to introduce him. Uh, he had reached out through us through the Saline County when they were working on their project out there and uh, set up a meeting with Brandon several months ago. And we've had several three, four, five meetings following with not just myself but with staff. He's met individually with staff just to look at our fleets, all of our vehicles from SUVs, pickups, cars, um, to some of the larger one-ton vehicles. And has put together a proposal here tonight uh, that I won't steal uh, his words, but I'll let him present it to you. But um, I'm going to run the slides for him and just let him walk you through the mm -hmm. handouts that he had. So this is Brandon Scott with Enterprise Fleet Management. Okay. Very Brandon. good. <clears throat> Appreciate you all having me. Um, I've been with Enterprise for over 13 years now managing fleets anywhere from 20 on up to 2,000. And really the goal in our fleet management division is to help our clients lower the cost of operating their fleets of vehicles. So it's kind of a unique uh, program that we have, especially in the government space. Most of the municipalities we partner with prior to their, their partnership with us will, uh, you know, buy vehicles, take contract, run it for 15, 20, 25 years till it's de dead or, uh, you know, has a major mechanical failure. and so. We're, it's a little bit of a shift in philosophy for sure um, to be able to maximize the equity in vehicles. Uh, and if Darren, you'll go to the next slide there. Did you want to call in first? Oh, yeah, sure. <coughs> we do have an individual from the corporate that's going to yeah. zoom in for the uh, meeting. Just hit the yeah. phone. Good evening. We have John Weselowski, uh, area sales manager over Kansas and Missouri with us, and uh, Chris Roth from our corporate headquarters. We have both you gentlemen there. Yes, this is John, hello. Very good. Okay. okay. Thank you. So, uh, certainly play play different roles um, we have multiple layers of our organization but what we're trying to do with every municipality is identify the fleet 
and, and then identify, hey, what's the optimal time to hold vehicles in your fleet in order to lower the total cost of ownership? So, Darren, if we go to the next slide. And so typically, you buy a, buy a truck, buy an SUV, buy a sedan, you drive it off a lot, it's worth less than it was 10 minutes prior, right? At some point, you know, the further you get on that orange line, you know, whether it's a 15, 20, 25 year old truck, it's not gonna continue to lose a lot of value because it's already lost virtually all of its value to that point. At the same token, older vehicles, you're gonna have a higher fuel expense. They don't make as good fuel economy. The newer vehicles are gonna produce um, better fuel economy. The maintenance expenses you'll see go up over the course of time as well. So we're trying to find that optimal time to replace every vehicle in your fleet. And it's certainly different for a, you know, an F-350 chassis with a flatbed on it than it is, you know, the run of mill F-150, you know, work truck uh, with just a toolbox. And so we're trying to find that optimal time to replace every vehicle <coughs> in your fleet. So uh, next slide, Darren. So from a big picture perspective, what's happened in the market over the last year is prior to COVID, the manufacturers were producing 17 million vehicles about per year. COVID hits, manufacturers stop producing vehicles, they start producing PPE and ventilators for pretty good reason, right? And so what happened is government entities, construction, plumbing, HVAC, healthcare are still moving and grooving through the pandemic and still utilizing vehicles, still purchasing vehicles. So what happens is the supply has constantly shrunk over the course of the last year. And we've got this massive void as every dealership in the country is dealing with right now of very low vehicle availability. Work trucks and cargo vans are scarce to say the least. Um, you know, you can still purchase sedans and, and SUVs and minivans and whatnot, but work trucks and, you know, your basic uh, vehicles for most of our partners are, are few and far between. So from a, uh, from a big picture perspective, not only is it gonna take the manufacturers now because of the microchip shortage to be able to get back to pre-production levels, it's gonna take even longer for them to backfill this void that is in the market. And so we're currently in this bubble um, in which the resale market is insane, just like the housing market is as well. So um, what that's doing, if you go to the next slide, Darren, <clears throat> is acquiring vehicles at your local dealer versus factory ordering vehicles is, we're seeing an even wider spread than what we've seen in previous years. So because, you know, just generally speaking, if you're gonna go out and buy a, a $40,000 F-150, $10,000 government incentive, so it's now $30,000 truck, what's left on dealer's lots at this point is basically a $50,000 F-150. It's your Larry, it's your King Ranch, you know, your, your Chevy Silverado, high countries. And so, sure, you're gonna get your $10,000 incentive off that, but now your $50,000 truck is $40,000. So to do the same job, as, as what you would really want or need an XL type of trim level basic work truck. So we factory order the overwhelming majority of our vehicles. Sure, it does take time for those vehicles to show up, but over the long haul, you're gonna get the best pricing. Uh, and because you all don't put that many miles on vehicles, it's not like you're reacting to transmissions blowing or engines blowing and, and needing uh, major catastrophic repairs to react quickly. So we have the ability, especially in the government space, to be proactive in factory order vehicles to time the market to where we maximize that resale coming back to the municipality we're working with. So if you go to the next slide. So this is a real world example of, of how um, our equity lease works. Typically when I mention the word lease, people cringe a little bit um, and, and our equity lease is very different. So there's no mileage penalties, there's no wear and tear penalties. We have 1,300 construction companies across uh, the United States, 700 oil and gas companies. So if you think your trucks that come back are gonna be in rough shape, you should see some of the ones we get turned in. So there's no wear and tear penalties. Uh, it's got a flexible term. So you know, if the market hits, as an example, COVID hit last year, the market tanked. And so we advise all of our clients, do not <laughs> dispose of your vehicles right now, hold on to them for another month, another couple months, and extend out the lease in order to maximize the equity. You don't want to sell it at the bottom of the market. So we did, market rebounded, and they sold for, for a premium. So in this example, we're talking about a 2021 F-250 regular cab pickup truck with four-wheel drive, very common in the government space, uh, five-year term, averaging 10,000 miles. Some of the trucks will do 15,000, 20,000, others will do 5,000, 6,000 miles a year on average about 10,000 miles a year. Using the government incentive, 
$30,400 initial vehicle cost. So you've got your monthly payments over the course of five years. We have you pay it down to a reduced book value. So instead of your traditional finance, where you'd fund it down to zero dollars, we know it's going to be worth something at you know the end of five years. So we help you conserve a little bit of cash flow and pay it down to a smaller residual. So you fast forward five years, we turn around and sell the truck for twenty thousand three hundred dollars. What's very different about our lease and your traditional you know dealership type of lease is uh, we give you the difference between the estimated resale value and the reduced book value on the vehicle. So that $12,700 of equity, that's not enterprise's money, that's Ellis County's money. And so by doing that, you know, we're, we're constantly pumping funds back into uh, our municipalities that we partner with. Next slide. So to further illustrate what we've done in the analysis and the proposal we put together is we've taken this short cycling, so instead of cycling out of 15, 20, 25 years per vehicle, we're now cycling a lot of these vehicles one or two years old. And that may seem very foreign <laughs> to you because why would you get rid of a one-year-old truck with 10,000 miles or a two-year-old truck with 20,000 miles? Well, it's because you bought it low and we're gonna sell it high and return those proceeds back to you. So. In this example, 2020, if we're looking backwards, 2020 F-250, this example has an extended cab truck, 4x4, market average at the time, 36 grand, state contract pricing, 28.4, turn around and sell it at one year old for 34.5, you literally are selling it more than what you bought it for. So we're taking this type of philosophy with, your, with every vehicle, you know, not, not every vehicle in your fleet, we're certainly not doing this for Sheriff Braun's patrol vehicles, you know, those are on more of a traditional four or five year cycle. Um, but some of the some of the you know noxious weeds vehicles and IT and, and some of these vehicles we really have a unique opportunity to maximize that equity and, and give that back to you really after um, you know a year or two. I want to pause any questions so far? I guess one for you. So we all know used vehicles are worth a premium right now. So what's going to happen when? all these chips get released from overseas and all these vehicles that are sitting on factory uh, lots where there's thousands of them sitting there that are one and two years old and I know you know that already. Yeah. Uh, when all them hit the market, they're going to, GM, Ford's going to reduce them vehicles by $20,000 to reduce them. So basically they're going to flood the market. What's that going to do to this? Is that going to react the same way a used vehicle is going to be worth less or not? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and from a big picture perspective, I think if you go back a, a few slides to, to the one with the, the different bars mm -hmm. on that's it, uh, one more. It's going to take time. So there's certainly, you know, to your point, you can see from the satellite images at the Kentucky Motor Speedway, and there's literally sure. thousands of vehicles you can see from space. That's how many there are. And yes, the market will be flooded. It will certainly take time. There when do you article. think that'll happen? Six months, a year? Yeah, that's a really good question. There was a there was an article I believe on 60 Minutes uh, about a month or so ago, um, and the one of the microchip, uh, the largest microchip uh, manufacturer, I believe out of Taiwan, said that it's going to take you know six to eight months before we get back up to normal production levels. It's then going to take even uh, basically a year, I think a year, 18 months or so, uh, in order to backfill all that demand right so is that what's going to happen like a, a 2019 or a 2020 vehicle been sitting there for two years are they just going to dump them yeah probably sure yeah I mean, I mean, it'll that, be a brand new vehicle say two years old or three years old yeah and that may be um and and i can tell you that that a lot of those vehicles there is so much pent-up demand right now that that will be you know a band-aid you know on a mm -hmm. on a huge wound so exactly um, it that will certainly help you know the sure. situation but you know normal situation we're we're short cycling vehicles you know pre-covid and you guys are big enough for you can we can unload them exactly yeah. you're going to dump them just like anybody else yeah exactly and we've got we've got 19,000 different buyers across the country so we have the ability and the the infrastructure to be able to move vehicles should it make sense hurricane harvey happens and Every vehicle down there is underwater, and so we're we're literally trucking vehicles down there to be able to sell and rent, so that people can get around after Harvey. And so, you know, we, we have the infrastructure and ability to do that to be able to maximize resale for you. So, we're 
because we're we're local. Uh, I mean, we're not here in Ellis County, sure, but um, you know, your, your client strategy manager is based out of Wichita, and so um, he's going to be meeting Justin Harper. He's going to be meeting with you three times a year to be able to push this information to you and update you. Hey, here's what's happening from a big picture perspective in the market um, to be able to you know react to those types of situations. Yeah. Okay, that's a great, great high level question. Thank you. Um, if you go down to the, the operating expenses, yep, that one. So I know Darren had a you know additional question on from a maintenance perspective. Uh, I, a couple things I can tell you from a, a, an onboarding and a maintenance uh, standpoint, we have pumped immense resources into our onboarding. We recognized as a company that you know once uh, we've agreed to terms with the partner, order vehicles. It was a sloppy transition, I think. <coughs> so really a year and a half, two years ago, we, we started to, to really pump major resources into our onboarding plan um, to be able to ensure more of a smooth transition for our clients. Because at the end of the day, it's all about customer service for us. That's why I'm wearing my 100% lapel pin is because I'm not happy unless you guys are happy. So we, our goal is every customer, every time, all the time, and, and our goal is 100% is customer satisfaction. So we want you to be happy with our program, and if you're not, then you'll stop doing business with us. So <coughs> we wanna ensure your happiness. So from an operating expenses standpoint and, and a maintenance, we've got 27 different shops that are within 50 miles of uh, this zip code. So uh, nine shops that are, that are in Hayes and have the ability to, to go to any of these shops, um, you know, should you know, sheriff break down or get a flat tire out you know, in, in Plainville, whatever it may be. So um, we, we've certainly got a, a large network of, of shops, but Chris, I know, Chris Roth uh, got on the phone from corporate, um, you know, just kind of talking to me about the process. He likes to have a call six months in with our clients to figure out, hey, what do you like? What do you not like? What do we need to add? What do we need to remove? How is this going? What do we need to tweak <coughs> with our services? Uh, Chris, anything to elaborate on there? Yeah, I think you pretty much hit everything. Um, you know, the biggest thing that I like to stress is that, um, you know, even though we're, we're based out of St. Louis, but we are, we're starting to have employees that work remote all over the country now, um, you know, our goal is to, is to really feel like we're in your office, right? Like we're part of your team. So whatever you guys need from an approval standpoint uh, or a tailoring the maintenance experience standpoint, you know, we're here for you guys. And, you know, my team uh, of ASC certified experts, you know, they treat your money like their own money. Um, you know, we make sure that we're using every resource available, you know, Mitchell, on demand, you know, we have access to all the manufacturers, warranty websites, the same thing a dealer technician would have. Um, you know, if we run into a really tough issue, we're picking up the phone and calling Detroit, you know, on your behalf to figure out, hey, what's going on with this, you know, or getting back on that computer module thing, um, you know, we can't make the computer chips. We're not quite that powerful yet, but, you know, we've got a pretty good seat at the table based on how many vehicles we order as a company. So when a transmission control module comes in to America, you know, we can get dibs on it, you know, most of the time. So, you know, I would say that it's just really that relationship with the National Service Department is what, what I think is the best part of both our full maintenance and our maintenance, product, uh, maintenance management product. If you really just get that, you know, full-time maintenance manager uh, with years of, of automotive experience, you know, both technical and in the service industry. Thank you, Chris. Um, next slide. <laughs> one of the one of the concerns I hear the most, probably the most frequently, is it doesn't seem real. This doesn't. This, this sounds too good to be true. Um, these are all of our current partners. We we've grown tremendously in the government space. We had about a thousand clients five years ago. And today we're, we have 1,600 or so, um, and we continue to add more and more. We, we add about 10 a month across the country, uh, and, and that certainly adds up over the, the course of time. But you know, Geary County, Leavenworth County, Shawnee County, uh, United Government, uh, Wyandotte County, those are you know, some of our other county partners here on the, the Kansas side. And um, you know, I encourage you, I think you may already have, but certainly to, to reach out. And, because they're going to tell you, you know, from an unbiased standpoint of you know, their thoughts on the, the program. So, um, any any questions? Uh, any other questions?
I have none. I have none. So the the last piece was the uh, the fleet synopsis and the one source well bid for fleet management services um, a few years ago. Uh, they put it out to RFP, and so most of our partners uh, piggyback on on that RFP as a part of their due diligence. And so, you know, at the end of the day, we're, we're trying to help lower your, your total cost of ownership. Um, you know, 43% of the forty three percent of the light, medium-duty vehicles, they're not up to date with safety standards. Well, that's very common across the country uh, from what we see before our partnerships. And, you know, one of those ancillary pieces of our partnership is being able to stay up to date with safety standards. So NHTSA, uh, National Highway and Traffic Safety Administration, has said that the most that electronic stability control is the most important safety invention since the invention of the seatbelt. And those are standard on all 2012 and 2012 model year and newer vehicles. So that's just one example of how, hey, instead of outlaying $700,000 in cash just to go update your vehicles to keep them up with safety standards, this is another one of those pieces that allows you without having that type of cash flow to be able to update. But you'll scroll down there. Um, at the end of the day, you know, Replacing 29 of the county's current vehicles, um, you know, the, the amount of equity in those vehicles is approximately $196,500. So we anticipate we'll be able to sell the county-owned vehicles uh, for around that number. It's sight unseen, but, you know, industry average, market average, based on the year, make, model, series, um, and equipment on those vehicles, that's what we anticipate. So first year payment, $237,726. We're kind of in a unique place right now because we're in between model years for most of the vehicles. So um, anyway, we'll, we'll have firm pricing on that uh, here over the next few weeks, but uh, we have the ability to order the 2022 F250, F350s right now. The order banks on uh, Chevy Silverados, GMC Sierras, Ram, uh, Ram trucks, those all open uh, July 1st and then uh, Ford F-150 opens in September for, for orders, so for the 22 model year. So, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we're anticipating over $770,000 worth of savings over the next 10 years. Um, not only that, you're switching from an aged fleet to a newer, safer, fresher, cleaner, more efficient fleet um, for less than, than what the current plan uh, current number showed to be. So um, the, uh, the last couple pages, just the, the fleet profile that I put together, the analysis, um, taking a deep dive in terms of, hey, which vehicles do we cycle out? When do we cycle out? <coughs> uh, you know, which year? How much do we think we can get for them? What vehicles do we replace them with? Uh, and so uh, all, of, all of the above kind of goes into uh, the next, next two slides. I'm happy to dive more into that um, if you all would like. But, and then the last last page is just a case study on the uh, the city of Lenexa. So that is all I have for you. Happy to answer any questions or concerns. I guess I have one thing, and it probably isn't going to particularly apply to Ellis County as much because all of our vehicles are based here. But when I worked for an oil company out of Denver, we we had enterprises lease vehicles. And we had a heck of a time sometimes getting our stuff fixed. And we had vehicles in Wyoming, Oklahoma, pretty remote areas, and I understand that situation. We couldn't just take it to the local mechanic shop. And at times we did, it took, I was in charge of it dealing with the enterprise folks, but sometimes I'd be on the phone two hours trying to get a set of windshield wiper blades replaced. Yikes. And it was just, it wasn't a good experience, but it looks like it's a lot better now. It looks like you guys have come a long way in the past 10 years. That was 10 years ago. Okay. That was the next question I was going to ask. Is how long so it was 10 years ago right at it. It'd be, well, it would be 10 years ago now. Okay. So, uh, so I know then that we just had a hard time, seems like, getting warranty work done because we was in remote areas. Pinedale, Wyoming was one of the areas, Big Piney, and then in Oklahoma, we was down in Alva and Enid yeah. and, uh, and further west. So we just had a lot of issues getting simple things you know we drew a tire out on the out on location you know and you'd have to go get a tire and it just it was a forever process all i did was stay on the phone trying to get this done and it, it wasn't a good experience yeah that's that's really but, but it's nice to see you guys have a lot more service centers in the area for like hayes for instance he got nine that'll that'll work yeah 
Yeah, we have nine. nine so, so what is the process now? Just something simple. Say, say Brenda needs windshield wipers for a set of for a couple trucks, or needs a couple sets of tires for pickups. And granted, within ten thousand miles, we should never have that problem. But you're sure. still going to ruin a tire here and there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so what is the process now from what it used to be 10 years ago? Yeah, great question. So we've got a couple different um, ways for you to essentially identify that it's an enterprise fleet vehicle. So one, we can either have you print off a, a card, a maintenance card that you leave in the truck mm -hmm. um, and it stays in there, or uh, you pull up the app and, and you walk into to Goodyear, Firestone, Lewis, um, you know, hey, Chevrolet, wherever you're taking okay. the vehicle, and you just show them that, that code uh, that's on either on your phone or on the, the card. And now all of a sudden, somebody from, you know, that service advisor from Goodyear, Firestone, Hay, Chevrolet, wherever, they're now communicating with one of our National Service Department um, experts that is on Chris's team. And so they're saying, hey, uh, you know, they may take it in for an oil change as an example, right? Sure. And, and they may say, hey, it's due for an oil change, a tire rotation, an air filter, and a flux capacitor. Well, for those of you who have seen the movie Back to the Future, we know that we're not time traveling, and so we're not going to put a flux capacitor on the vehicle. Uh, you know, an air filter, uh, maybe that's not needed for 48,000 miles, you know, every 24,000 mile interval. We're not quite there yet. We just rotate the tires, but go ahead and do the oil change. So we're, you know, we're, we're constantly monitoring it based on the manufacturer recommendations in terms of, hey, which vehicles and what types of. And you know, and where they drive a lot of country roads, there's a lot more, like right now, everything's real dusty, dirty. So you're going to go through them wear items quicker. Sure. Brakes or filters, etc. Yeah, I just was. I guess I just want to have a lot of confidence that that program has changed from what it used to be ten years ago. Yeah, Chris, and it any, sounds like it has. Yeah, Chris, anything to add there? Sure. Um, you know, you definitely hit the more popular scenario where we'd be, you know, rejecting flux capacitors uh, in, in all the <laughs> unheated services. But uh, one of the main things that I coach my team for is actually adding services. Um, nowadays, these vehicles, you know, they're, they're amazing pieces of the technology, but they're temperamental, right? So you got to make sure that that transmission fluid gets flushed at just the right mileage. Um, you know, some of the you know some of the brake systems on the Nissan vans need it every thirty thousand miles differential. So, the biggest thing that I really coach my team in on, is, you know, the services that they didn't that they didn't reject, but it's the services they didn't add. Um, you know, we've got a great relationship with our manufacturers. So, you know, if we blow a transmission 10,000 miles after the warranty's out, you know, we can call Ford up and say, hey, this one shouldn't have let go this early. You know, how about you help us out a little bit? You know, and they'll give us some after the fact assistance or post warranty assistance. It doesn't happen if we miss services. So, you know, I, I think that the value of NSD for sure, we're going to decline the money needed services and we're going to make sure that the labor rates are right in line. Um, you know, that's that's day one, job one stuff that we have to do. Um, but I think the real value is, you know, we're going to make sure that it's properly maintained. And that means rejecting and adding services when they're due. Um, the mantra that my team lives by is right service, right price, right time. Uh, and, you know, you're going to have a, a vehicle that's worth more money at the end of the line if we do that. Um, so yeah, you know, I, I really think you know, hit the nail on the head. Um, you know, whoever mentioned, you know, sorry, it's a little fuzzy connection, but whoever mentioned, yeah, our air filters probably need to be replaced more than 24,000. Totally agree, depending on the situation. Um, you know, I've got pharmaceutical sales reps who can use one air filter every 50,000 miles. I've got oil, uh, oil field, you know, uh, welders that need one every 5,000 miles. So um, it really is just, you know, talking to the driver, talking to the shop. Hey, how are the wiper blades? How's the air filter? How's the cabin air filter? Um, you know, your tires rumbling, you know, when they're going down the highway, do we need a balance? Um, you know, just really talking to that driver and talking to the shop to get a real sense of what it actually needs. Our guys are good enough. They know if they're, you know, being sold something that doesn't really need, you know, doesn't really need it, you know, shocks every 20,000 miles. That's not going to happen, you know, but if you need an air filter or a set of wiper blades, we're going to get it done. Because it's cheaper to do the air filter than it is a turbo or an engine for sure. <laughs> I guess one question and for if both. I could add Chris and Brandon. Um, I think the question, it, it's a little bit hard to hear if we have a couple of folks farther away from the um, receiver there, but <clears throat> one of the big differences between now and 10 years ago, I think that was the question, and I think the scenario was, hey, we were waiting on hold for a really long time, or we had somebody in a remote area waiting in a shop for a really long time. Um, our preferred vendors today in our program are a part of auto integrate as are we. So what that means um, 
in very layman's terms, is a lot of those approvals come through via computer and we give approvals back via computer. So as quickly as we get those repair orders is as quickly as we're approving them. And then those shops get a credit card right away to run so that they can get paid right away for the service. So that is one of the big technological upgrades from our national service department is the use of auto integrate. Yeah, and I'll build on that. That was about seven years ago. We made the transition over to auto integrate and uh, we were kind of the first, but since then a lot of our uh, competitors have joined on as well. So um, we've been able to kind of tailor auto integrate to suit our needs, but it's nice that the shops have multiple fleet management companies using auto integrate. So there's that familiarity there. Uh, and what that means for you guys is it cuts down on downtime. You know, they're not figuring out a different system for every company. They know how to use auto integrate. They're comfortable with it. We track how many, you know, repair orders they submit to us online. Um, my favorite part is if, if you, you know, get an approval from us, you know, say we set your, your approval limit at $1,000, you read our notes, we recommend the services, everything's in line. As soon as you hit approve, it skips the National Service Department, goes right back to the shop, it cuts us out of it, just to get your driver back on the road as soon as possible. So it, it's just, a, it's such a different system than it was 10 years ago. Uh, and it just, it's been worked over every year. We make an improvement here or there, just to really benefit you guys at the end run. I think you had a question. Yep. I guess one of the other questions I had for maybe all three of you, when we ordered these 20 vehicles, you know, 10 years ago, we had everything from King Ranches to F-350 Duallys, and it seems like all the F-150s would come out with six-ply tires, and they never lasted. Uh, had a lot of tire problems, and on the F-250s, they always had the cheapest tire that you could put on a vehicle. Has that changed since then? Do we Are we running better tires now, 10-ply tires on F-250s, things like that? What, what have we done since then? Yeah, that's a really good question. So part of our process is we're because we factory order the vehicles, we can mm -hmm. literally build them spec by spec, piece of equipment by so piece. You're just not ordering a basic F-150 <laughs> with six-ply tires, roll-up windows, and everything else. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Because... Because we're also considering from a resale perspective, exactly. you guys are only using it for a year or two uh -huh. years or sure. five years even. And so, hey, what equipment would the next buyer potentially want? And so exactly. generally speaking, for most of our municipalities we partner with, it's going to have creature comforts, power windows, power door locks, cruise control, uh, backup camera for pickup trucks, spray and bed liner to protect the bed, um, and tow capability. Um, whether or not your departments are using the, the towing, that's not as important. Um, appraiser's office obviously isn't towing anything, but you know, having them in the most cost-effective vehicle and for uh, resale. Yeah, for resale, we're gonna okay. we're gonna make those decisions to be able because we're gonna say, hey, you know, from a total cost of ownership, it'll cost you you know three thousand bucks a year for this vehicle, or you can you know basically break even on on this vehicle over here. So sure. that's you know what what I've worked with Darren and, and a Good. lot of the department heads, but more specifically. Um, noxious weeds. We we upgraded those tires for okay. for them because they're up, you know obviously. Good. Sounds yeah. like you're on top of it. Then you're answering all my questions. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. I just know we had kind of a not a not the best experience ten years ago with Enterprise through that, and it looks like you've came a long way, which is great. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. There's a couple other things that we've had. Like <clears throat> Brandon's met with Brendan, Jason, Mike, the appraisers, the environmental solid waste myself but each vehicle is a little bit different based on their needs um, for instance as he kind of alluded to a little bit ago the sheriff's office their their cars are only going to be four years i believe yeah but then when they order them they'll order them and they'll get shipped down to wichita and then there's a outfit company out there that um jay or not jason um, scott has worked with and looked at the value of having them receive the vehicle and outfit it with the radios, the cages, the shotgun holders, the consoles, the lights, the sirens, and do all of that here instead of having a deputy off the road doing it here locally. And he figured it was more cost effective to do all that down there for their labor hours. So that's one good thing there. And um, tires, I think on all the vehicles, we're all, I, the, we went through a lot of those items with each department to make sure that um, the things that they were needing, like IT was looking at a, a topper for their truck to, uh, to keep their IT equipment in the back and um, Jason and I uh, with our emergency response vehicles we're just going to get the vehicle here and then we're going to work on them locally to do all the upfitting 
because we don't need as much as the, the, the deputies have in all of theirs. We can do it here locally. So it's it's a mix of a lot of different things depending on which department you're talking to. Okay. And some vehicles, um, some departments uh, are not replacing the same vehicle that they have. They're going from a, like the Jeep from Mike is going to a, a pickup instead and uh, different things like that. So there's a lot of work in behind the scenes to get to this point to get us to where these numbers are at today. Sorry to interrupt. Most of our vehicles would be traded out every year? There's a good portion of them. Um, we certainly aren't starting with the entire fleet, but mm -hmm. um, we've identified that there are 23 uh, vehicles, at least to start, uh, of, of the vehicles owned by the county that we would look at replacing every year. And um, we've got six different uh, sheriff's vehicles that we're looking at a four-year cycle on those mm -hmm. to start with and upfit those. Um, yeah, solid waste, public works, um, IT, buildings and grounds, appraisers, EMS, um, noxious weeds. So yeah, most of the departments we've we've identified. Uh, there were 23 of them to in, in this first year, and then an additional six in the sheriff's department. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, and and then you know obviously part of our job is we want to prove the concept to you and say hey this this worked. You know, does it make sense to continue to expand the program? next year and the following year and, and so forth and so on and and again we we don't require you to order a certain percentage or a certain quantity of vehicles through us um, because we believe in the value that we provide and if we we're not providing value then you're going to stop ordering vehicles from us and just go back to doing what you were doing so because of the the, the lack of a, a long-term you know quantity of vehicles that you know we don't require you to do that really allows our, our municipalities to feel a lot more comfortable with with our program entering into an agreement with with our program. So, mm -hmm. uh, does that answer? Yeah. You? Yes. It's this very innovative approach. Um, I'm kind of excited about something like this. So there's no penalties for overage on miles. No, that's a wonderful question. Uh, Darren, because scroll. prior 10 years ago we had we ran into that of course we'd yeah. run 50,000 miles a year yeah yeah if we'd go over that 50 there was it would cost us like three thousand dollars a vehicle yeah no overage not at all if you go back to the the slide with the uh, blue down arrow um and, and, I, and I seen that on there on where you're where you're headed to I seen <laughs> that on that slide that said there's no yeah, penalty. No, for, I just wanted to make sure that's for sure. So what happens in that light. scenario is also part of the reason we're meeting with you two, three, really three times a year is to be able to say, hey, we've projected these to do 10,000 miles a year. This one over here is doing 30,000 miles a year, right? And so what that's going to do is let's say it comes back, you know, after a year with 30,000 miles instead of a year with 10,000 miles, just for simplicity, simplicity, it's going to lower that resale value from, you know, if you go to the next slide down, uh, it lowers resale value from you know thirty four five to thirty three thousand. You know, adding twenty thousand miles, it's not going to lower it dramatically. Okay. Um, so you certainly won't get as much in equity back, but you're also going to have vehicles. You know, some of the vehicles in the county are doing. Well, we always had to pay penalties on ours. I mean, we were always constantly watching mileage and. Yeah, ninety paying penalties. Ninety eight percent of our clients now go with our equity lease uh, okay. with this option. We still have the the close ended lease, the the net lease, which is like your traditional uh, dealership lease. But ninety seven, ninety eight percent of our clients have no idea how many miles they're going to be going, what kind of condition it's going to be in, or how long they need to keep the vehicle. Um, and so the, our our equity lease really provides all that flexibility. And, there's no penalties whatsoever. Okay. You just got to understand that, hey, if it comes back with more miles, it's going to sell for a little bit less. Mm -hmm. You're also going to have some vehicles come back with fewer miles that'll sell for more. So, sure. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Neal, any questions? I do like the idea with the heavier ply tires. I, I run nothing but 10 ply on all my vehicles. Um, nothing worse than somebody going out somewhere, uh, assisting somebody and having to fix a flat tire that's supposedly a six ply and it's probably only a four mm -hmm. um not only that i'm i'm kind of excited too when we do the bidding process for different vehicles the heads how much time do they spend getting price from ford chevy all that i mean it has to be a big savings that we don't have a person doing all that footwork so i'm excited about this mm -hmm. and see how it's gonna work so mm -hmm. 
Well, Commissioner, is it makes the budgeting process easier? Oh, it does. I mean, you know I'm, what you're going to pay basically right. up front. Sheriff Brown was excited about it last week when he when he talked about it. It's it puts uh, vehicles are safer. Um, it, it's going to provide less maintenance costs, so our mechanics can do things other than just maintain vehicles. Uh, that should help Brandon out. Uh, I, I just see where it's a win-win for the county, and if the enterprise people make money off of this, and we do well by I'm, I would like to see us pursue this thing and see how it comes out I, I guess if after a few years it's not liked we could always back out of it yeah you just stop ordering and that vehicles sort of thing so you, you just continue to pay down the principal it's it's definitely changed from what it was 10 years ago I can mm -hmm. tell you by reading everything that you gave us or Darren sent us out it it definitely looks different than it did 10 10 years ago you guys have came a long ways it looks like which is good yeah it's exciting thank you so do i hear a motion from any of you guys i'll make a motion i move to approve and move forward with the enterprise fleet management program and allow the county administrator to sign the attached lease documents i'll second that we have a motion and a second all in favor say aye aye, aye. motion passes three zero thank you all very much thank you thank you for coming yep Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron, you gonna rescue us now? What's that? Are you going to rescue us now? Which page to go to? No, on the uh, on the next item. American Rescue Plan. <laughs> rescue. Okay, uh, the next agenda item is the American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, Darren, as part of the the ARPA funds that are being released to the county in the coming month or so, uh, there's several processes that have to go into place before we can receive the funding. Um, working with the clerk's office, we have to ensure our DUNS number and everything is up to date and our contact information is up to date, but also we have to name a certifying official for the funds as well as a center point of contact. And uh, through a recent web webinar, each county is a little bit different based on their functionalities of how their organization or their counties are set up. Uh, some counties have their clerks do it, some have a, just a commissioner take care of all the work. and. Uh, but most of the ones that have a county administrator that manages the funds um, is is that person and the point of contact came up is um, having that is a more stable position so that way if the points if something happens um, it's less likely that the uh, well, at least in my case i guess <laughs> that the county administrator doesn't get turned over and, and go elsewhere and can continue through this process um, the arpa funds are not going to be have to be spent in three to four months like we did last year uh, we're going to have three to four years, so it's a multi-year process. And I was just asking the commission's direction on how you'd like to move forward with that point of contact, and I would be more than happy to uh, take over that project once we start moving forward here in, in the coming months. Well, Darren, I think you would be a fine point of contact for that. Are you going to be here for three to four years? I, I think that's up to the three of you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let you know. <laughs> I think that'd be a great idea too, Butch. I, mean, I do too. Yeah. Okay. Once we get more information, I know there's the conference here in the next couple of days. There's going to be some information, and mm -hmm. um, as counties start receiving their funds, um, there's going to be different approaches on how it's being used. But one thing I would also like to uh, ask the commission tonight is a lot of the. The funds that are being spent this time or the way they are allowable to be spent are different than what we used back with the cares money in 2020 so what i would like to do at least at this point would be looking at a, um, a cpa a certified public accountant a firm uh, just just to send out an rfp uh, because the the funds that we could use to pay for that are, can come out of those arpa funds and i'd just like to send out an RFP, see what the responses are, what their proposals are, what those will cost. And so that way we can make a better determination if we need an outside legal counsel, a CPA to, to review those funds, expenditures, purchases, processes. And um, like I say, most 
not most of the other counties, but a lot of the other counties are actually hiring firms this time just because it goes over multiple year and the restrictions of the funds are going to be a lot more scrutinized this time as to, to how they're being spent. But are, are there some firms more specialized in this particular area? Yes, there's uh, several in the state that have been discussed around. I've had a couple of different calls with the county administrators and they have a couple of different agencies that are, um, they all recommend some of them that they don't, but um, you know, different firms match different agencies differently because of the size, you know, what we may need out in Ellis County may not mean, need what they need in Johnson County or Leavenworth sure. exactly. So um, it, it's, it's just gonna, all going to depend. But by the time we get the RFP, I have, a, I have a draft copy out. We send it out for a month and get reviews. Um, I'll have a good four, five, six weeks to really digest what the spending criteria are, and then we can make a better determination to say, yeah, this would be a good, good suggestion to move forward with. Here's the price. Or we can say, no, we can handle this again internally, and let's just save mm -hmm. X amount of dollars and just handle it in-house. Um, which I'm I have a feeling that might be where we're going, but at least we have the option to know we at least pursued that. Sure. I'm in favor of that, Darren. Okay. I think so that'd, that'd be good RFP, to do. RFP, see what we get back. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> okay, the next agenda item is uh, fireworks resolution 21-11 hard to believe we're at that point of the year already but uh, each year the first week in June we bring it to the Commission to discuss the dis the allowable discharge of fireworks in the unincorporated areas of Ellis County and here we are the first meeting in June and we're seven eight inches above average for the year in rainfall and I'm guessing the Commission probably is going to have any concern on allowing the fireworks to be discharged uh, as in the past three or four years I recommend that we keep the dates the same for the city of Hayes, just to help eliminate confusion as to where that's the the biggest bulk of where all the fireworks are being discharged, and um, they're a little bit different in Allison, Victoria. Mm -hmm. but, um, but like I say, the big bulk of what's being just bought and discharged is uh, right around the city of Hayes. <coughs> so with that, if, if the commission would like to allow uh, the fireworks in the county, just have a motion on there for you to to read to, to allow that okay. lift on the ban. Commissioners, any discussion? Right now, I don't mm -hmm. have any, mm -hmm. any concerns. No. Nope. Okay. Well, I move per resolution 2018-05 to relax the discharge portion of the resolution in the unincorporated areas of Ellis County on July 2nd, 3rd, and 4th from the hours between 10 a.m. and 11 p.m. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes 3-0. Okay, county administrator report. The only thing that I have tonight is ask for the, the commission chair to sign another utility agreement with an oil lease company up on along the Northwest Business Corridor project. Mm -hmm. And if I can get your signature after or before we leave this evening, I'd appreciate it. Okay, we'll do that. <coughs> Okay, County Commission reports. Commissioner Neal. The only thing I have that we, uh, as everybody knows, we got a good rain there in Munder, a flood, I guess. Um, I had some people that approached me that would like to uh, have our personnel, probably Brandon, look at some of the culverts. They had some concerns that they weren't big enough. 90% uh -huh. of them are closed up with dirt um, so that's my only thing if I could have Brandon sometime look at that mm -hmm. if I can speak, I can real quick. yes um, I had one individual was even uh, pledging money to he was gonna put five thousand dollars to help out on I'm sure you know about that so oh, yeah so Brenda McKay Hills County Public Works director the five thousand doesn't go as far as it did before the Cost of CM Corgia metal pipe for an 18 inch pipe went from 1350 a year ago to $36 a foot. So costs have gone up. A lot of the flooding, just like most of our county roads, a lot of our culverts, box bridges, box culverts, they're designed for a five, 10 year, or maybe a 20 year storm event. We don't have the funding like the state does 
what's on I-70 is a 500-year storm event. If we built everything to a 500-year storm event, instead of having 190, almost 200 bridges in this county, we'd ha probably have close to six, 700. So when you get an act like that, where you have four inches of rain within an hour, unless it's a large open bridge, it's going to overtop. It's going to back up. But we will take a look at it and see what we can do, see if we can help it just like with everything, it comes with a cost. Mm -hmm. So I, a lot of our stuff is not designed to handle rain events like that just because it's a 100 year, 500 year storm. They're not meant to happen every year. So in order to save costs, you design around the storms you're more likely to see. And when you get events like that, you just pick up the pieces when it's over and repair the best you can. But we can take a look at that, Neil. Okay, thank you. Hey, Brendan, while you're there. Yes, sir. When, when might you finish the Codell Road from that mile that's just one lane? It's Oh, yeah. I get I get calls on that, maybe not every day, but all the time, because the rock's been piled there for weeks. We do, too. So we're, try we're trying to do it by splitting it in half, okay. doing one mile at a time, north and south, working our way between the pits. But as you know, we just had that major flooding event up in Natone in the northeast part. So then all hands went on deck repairing the flood damage up there just got done we're about ready to start moving on that and then the flood and munger haze area happened and in victoria to a lesser extent sure we're getting that patched in and after that patched in we're hoping probably later this week to lay that out good is what our talks are Perfect. But it'd be nice if the rain would stop a little bit and let up some so we can lay that out because we're almost asphalt season and i don't think people would be happy if we left codale with a mile of rock laid alongside it we're trying to lay asphalt you consider it's a one laid road right now <laughs> yeah it's when it's done it'll be a nice road it's just oh yeah weather needs to cooperate with us a little bit mm -hmm. sounds oh. good all right okay. thank you okay commissioner hazelhorse that's an earth shattering i guess nothing new okay uh, i just reported i had a, a meeting today as i did a month ago with our Hayes mayor find it somewhat productive to sit down and visit with her nothing no agenda item specifically but just some good general discussion yep that mine is uh next monday with her mm -hmm. michael so okay uh executive sessions i move the board of county commissioners recess into executive session for 10 minutes pursuant to the attorney client privilege exemption the subject to be discussed during the executive session is land usage those in attendance will be the Board of County Commissioners, Mr. Bill Jeter, Mason Reuter, Mason is here, Mason Reuter, and Darren Myers. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes 3 0. Sorry, Mason, I didn't see you out there earlier.
Lots of action, but we can't tell you. You <laughs> No action. I move the Board of County Commissioners recess into executive session for 10 minutes. Under the following exemption to the Kansas Open Meeting Act, pursuant to attorney client privilege exemption. Subject to be discussed during executive session is litigation. Those in attendance, Board of County Commissioners, Mr. Bill Jeter, Darren Myers, and Brendan McKay. I'll second that.
there's no action taken and uh, the meeting will adjourn at 638.